Uh, my name is Quinton Mackey, and I am the National Organizing Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not familiar, many of you probably are, the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, we believe in a life-centered world uh, where, what a novel idea, governments and people actually respect wildlife, wildlands, clean air and water, um, and we believe that, you know, saving the planet uh, is the important thing to do these days. And many of you have been part of our recent national campaign uh, to save wolves from losing Endangered Species Act protections. Um, and now, unfortunately, we're coming together tonight because the very law that saved wolves from the brink of extinction 40 years ago and thousands of other plants, animals, uh, wildlife has just been gutted by the Trump administration. Um, this reckless, greedy, corporate-focused, short-term move paves the way for big companies and corporations to drill, frack, log, mine, with no regard for wildlife and the habitat they depend on. Uh, and this tonight uh, is our effort to say, not on our watch. The center has a long and deep history of fighting for biodiversity and fighting for wildlife and wild places on the planet. Uh, and this is gonna be the next big fight uh, we are going to make sure that the Endangered Species Act stays um, and continues to protect so many valuable species uh, across this country. Just want to give you a brief uh, overview of what's going to happen on tonight's call. So first, we're going to give you a rundown on President Trump's latest attack on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and we have tonight the center's very own executive director, Karan Suckling, who will be joining us to give us that update. Uh, two, we're going to talk about how you can become a leader in the fight to save wildlands and wild places. Um, this effort is really going to come down to what you can do to spread the word and organize folks um, to stand up and make a fight for the Endangered Species Act. And three, we're going to go over that plan for fighting Trump's extinction plan uh, and to give you a, an understanding of how we're going to stand up for the ESA and make sure all of this uh, gets protected in the next several weeks. Uh, at the end of the call, we're going to do some Q&A, and that generally depends on how many questions we have, but overall the call should take about an hour. Um, we're going to dive in uh, in just one second, but I want to introduce and pass this uh, microphone to my co-host and colleague, Valerie Love, to introduce herself and go over a couple of tech tips. All right. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. I'm, as Quentin said, I'm Valerie. I'm the Deputy Organizing Director with the Center. Um, and it's been a rough couple weeks with this news coming out, but I am so heartened to see so many people on the call. We have over uh, 360 people on the call right now. So that's amazing. Thank you for being on. Um, a couple of notes on tech, if this is your first time on Zoom, there is a chat box. I see a bunch of people have found it already, but if you're looking at your, your Zoom window at the bottom, um, you can hover your mouse and a number of icons should pop up. One is the chat, uh, and it's always fun. I see folks already introducing themselves and saying where they're um, calling in from. It's nice to interact with others and see where everybody is uh, coming in from. It's also a good place to you know, comment or chat. Uh, I will say the chat can get kind of overwhelming on a big call like this, so use it to the extent it's useful to you. And if you have a question, because it might get lost in the very busy chat, um, the best place to put that is in the Q&A bucket. So again, at the bottom of your screen, you should see some icons. There's a little Q&A icon. Um, and I see we already have a few questions there. So that's where you can park your questions. I also recommend just holding on to them till the end so that um, we will do question and answer at the end and we may cover it between now and then. So that'll make sure we don't answer it again at the end if it's unnecessary. Uh, okay, lastly on tech, um, if you called in, so if you didn't use the Zoom app on your phone or your computer, no worries, welcome, but just a heads up, you won't see those features, um, but we will make sure that we, anything that's visual, we'll repeat it, uh, we'll repeat it, and so that it will work for you as well, just with the audio experience. 
Harrison and Diane are running tech tonight. Uh, so I'd like to just point them out and have them introduce themselves quickly. They'll be interacting with you mostly um, through the chat and supporting us. So um, Harrison. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Harrison, and uh, I'm a California organizing intern based out of the Oakland office. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us uh, to learn what you can do to stop this egregious attack on our wildlife and lands. And, um, you know, activism and support from folks like you all is crucial for the fight ahead. Um, so thanks so much. Diane? Hey everyone, I'm Diane. It's so great to see so many familiar names on the call and I look forward to working with all of you who are new. Um, I am an organizer on the team based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, so glad to be on the call with all of you tonight. And with that, I'll pass it back to Valerie. All right. Uh, so before we get started, I also just want to go over quickly. I'm sharing my screen here, the community guidelines. And this is kind of the foundation for just how we interact with one another, including on this call. So um, one, I'll be friendly and respectful in my interactions with others. So that includes in the chat in tonight's call. Um, just remember to be friendly and respectful. Um, you'll follow through on what you say you'll do to the best of your ability. That speaks for itself. Um, I will be inclusive, emphasize bottom-up organizing, let people speak for themselves and work together in solidarity and mutuality. In other words, in support of the Jemez principles. Um, you can look them up for a fuller rendition of that, but those are principles that we aspire to in our organizing. Um, and I agree to nonviolence as a principle and a practice in all actions taken with the Center for Biological Diversity. So thank you in advance um, for helping foster a community that's welcome and inclusive to all. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director. Very thrilled to have him on, Kiran Seckling, for a rundown of this latest uh, attack on the Endangered Species Act and what's at stake. Kiran? Hi, thank you. And I want to thank everybody for coming on. We've got a really large crowd today, which is great because uh, this assault uh, that Trump has just launched on the Endangered Species Act uh, is extraordinarily damaging. The Endangered Species Act is the strongest environmental law in the U.S., certainly, uh, quite likely in the world. Um, and it's because of its strength and because of how it really directly uh, allows us to fight the mass extinction crisis, uh, the center has specialized in using the Endangered Species Act uh, throughout its entire 30-year history. And so to date, uh, we've used it to protect over 700 endangered species um, and a little over half a billion acres of land because uh, habitat destruction is still the greatest threat to endangered species. Uh, and the Endangered Species Act really focuses on that dramatically. Uh, and has allowed us to um, uh, protect over 500 million acres of land for species. Uh, the Energy Speech Act is a, is a big, complicated law, um, but when I summarize it, um, I usually pick out four parts um, that I think of as uh, being the, the central protective aspects of the law, and that is the, the listing of species, actually get them onto an endangered species list so they're protected because it doesn't matter how imperiled you are if you're not actually on the list you don't have the protections there's the establishment of critical habitat areas for these species so these are specifically mapped out highly protected areas that are supposed to be set up for all endangered species uh, and protected for them there is the uh, prohibition on the killing of any endangered species. And finally, there is the law places federal wildlife agencies uh, in a watchdog position um, to oversee what everyone is doing in terms of impacting endangered species. And so that includes corporations, it includes states, but very importantly, 
also other federal agencies, because we have lots of federal agencies that are destroying endangered species and their habitats. They're building uh, roads, highways, they're logging, they're mining, they're approving oil and gas uh, drilling. They are either doing hopefully a good, but often not good enough job at, at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, so this oversight uh, provision is really um, critical. And what's really disturbing about the regulations that the Trump administration um, put out uh, about two weeks ago is they're aimed directly at each of these four critical points. And that's not an accident at all. Our current Secretary of Interior, a guy named Bernhard, uh, is very smart, very evil, long history uh, as a lobbyist for developers, oil and gas uh, companies. Um, and he knows as well as we do what makes the act work. And consequently, he's gone right after these uh, in these regulations that just got put out. It really takes a wrecking ball to the Endangered Species Act. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit about what they do, although I'm going to keep it short and can ask questions later. But first, I just want to explain the relationship between the law and uh, the regulation. So the Endangered Species Act is a law is still in place. The law has not been changed in, in any way. Uh, and in fact, uh, Republicans in Congress uh, have introduced well over 100 uh, uh, bills to actually undermine the law itself in Congress over the last few years. And every single one of them has failed because when they tried to amend the Endangered Species Act, in Congress, that happens in public, where it can all be seen, and there's public debate, and there are political consequences, and the result is these uh, attempts always fail. The act is just too popular. So what the administration has done is to say, well, we're going to change the regulations. These are the ways that the rules that we create ourselves uh, by the president on how to implement it. And in, in theory, uh, your implementing rules must be consistent with the act because the act is still in place. Uh, but in fact, these rules that were just put out by the administration uh, violate the Indian Species Act uh, seven ways from Sunday. Um, and this is their way to go in and gut the act without going through a full public process and putting it up for a debate and having uh, the political consequences of, of doing so. And that's why these regulations are so critical. So I'll go through them uh, briefly. We will get back to um, comments and then. So the first part is listing endangered species, getting them onto this. Right now, there's about 1,700 uh, endangered species, uh, which covers on the list, covers everything from polar bears to wolves, lynx uh, to butterflies, uh, hawks, uh, all kinds of species, a ton of uh, plants very few people uh, have heard of. It really covers the whole realm of imperiled species. And what the law says is the decision to protect them must be made solely using scientific information about their imperilment. No political information or pressure is allowed. Very importantly, no economic consideration is allowed. Because the question before you is, is the species endangered? That's a purely scientific question. The issue of, well, what will the economic ramifications be to the oil industry, they may be large, but has nothing to do with determining whether the species is endangered or not. And so this bright line of um, 
making decisions under the ESA solely based on science, excluding politics, excluding economics, is one of the key reasons why the Endangered Species Act is so powerful and so successful. So what the Trump regulations do is it injects politics and economics right into the listing decisions. It allows the agency to actually calculate what they think the cost, the economic cost of uh, listing species will be, which is A, completely illegal. B, as you can imagine, they're not calculating any of the economic benefit of listing species, just the cost. And since it happens before the species is even put on the list, it's just pure speculation. And so what the agency is going to do is just speculate massive economic impact, uh, get Trump to tweet it out, uh, and then use that to prevent listing of species. Um, secondly, uh, species, um, when they're put on the list, they're almost all in decline. And so when you're thinking about what's their status, you're thinking about not simply where they're at at this moment, but what's the rate of decline? What's this going to look like in five years, in 10 years, in, in 20 years? And you're going to take into account things like, oh, well, all these areas have been leased for oil and gas. They haven't been drilled yet, but there will be drilling. We know that because they're, they're leased. We know exactly where the oil will go. So it's very important that one looks out toward the future to see what is happening to these species. Um, and the new regulations dramatically limit how the agency can look into the future and how far it can look into the future um, in order to try to just keep a very narrow uh, sense of imperilment. So that's a huge problem, especially for species threatened by climate change. I mean, we've got really good models telling us what the climate is going to look like out 40, 50, 100 years from now. Um, and these are no longer usable. So we're going to see far fewer species ever get protected, which means they're going to go extinct. Virtually every species that has gone extinct in the last 50 years was not on the endangered species list, and that's what's going to happen. So secondly, the agency is supposed to establish these critical habitat preserves for all endangered species. Um, the new regs uh, create all these loopholes to allow the agency to not do that. Um, so we're going to see much fewer uh, habitat preserved swore species. We're going to see existing ones shrunk down or even eliminated. And then while the Endangered Species Act says, once they're set up, you're not allowed to destroy or even harm them, the new rules say, oh, well, we're going to allow people to harm endangered uh, species critical habitat areas. Um, they're no longer going to be inviolate, uh, which is going to just dramatically reduce their, their usability. Um, then there's a prohibition on killing. So it's called Take on Endangered Species Act. I'll just call it killing today. When a species is listed, whether it's threatened or it's listed as endangered, uh, right now, and for the 50 year history of the act, as soon as you go on the list, it becomes illegal to kill the species. And that obviously makes sense. These species are going extinct because they're being killed. So we need to stop the killing. It's one of the most powerful uh, facets of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the new regulations say that for all species that are listed as threatened rather than endangered, and that's about half the species on the list. Uh, so it's about 800 uh, of the 1,700 species. They're no longer going to automatically prevent killing. So we're left with the absurdity. A species was just put on the, the, the endangered list because it's being killed and is going extinct, but yet going on the list does no longer automatically prevent killing or making it illegal. It can be perfectly legal for oil companies, for hunters, for um, just vigilantes to kill the species, even though you just put it on the endangered species list. The agency says, well, we're not going to do that automatically, but we'll do it one by one on a case 
by case basis. Now, the problem with that is, uh, well, A, they won't do it, and they're not required to do it, uh, and B, it'll dramatically drive up uh, the cost uh, and create huge delays, which we just can't afford to reduce. So this is a, a, a massive problem. We would not have recovered wolves to the point we were at today if we were allowed free range killing of them uh, by any individual state agency or corporation. And then finally, the watchdog aspect. So uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and the National Marine Fisheries Service have a tremendous responsibility and power to watchdog what everyone else is doing. So whether it's a state agency that has trapping policies or is allowing timber sales on state lands, whether it's corporations that are building massive developments, or very importantly, whether it's other federal agencies like the US Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management or the Federal Highway Department. These federal agencies actually are critical and are central to, to approving, authorizing, and funding most of the environmental destruction that happens uh, in this country. And so these uh, having the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service oversee these other agencies, make independent judgments, hold their feet to the fire and say, no, we cannot do that, is a very critical function of the Indian Species Act. The new regulations greatly undermine that, uh, give these other agencies much more discretion to make their own call about whether species are impacted, which of course uh, is a conflict of interest because they're the ones who want to build a highway. They're the ones who are making money off the timber sale or the oil drilling operation uh, to make that call themselves and not have uh, the federal oversight. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I hope I've given you the sense that you know this is just like driving a Mack truck through the center of the Endangered Species Act, uh, dramatically weakening all the critical aspects of it and it's incredibly important that we stop this. Um, and that's going to play out, uh, I think Quentin will, will talk a bit more uh, about that, but that's going to play out on multiple fronts, all working together, all simultaneously. So for example, the center has already filed suit um, last week uh, over uh, parts of the regulations. Uh, to strike them down. Um, we've got to wait 60 days and we'll be filing another series of lawsuits over the regulations. So there's a legal element to it. Uh, but we can't entirely rely on that uh, because these suits take a lot of time. They're very complicated in front of judges and possibly end up in the Supreme Court uh, in front of um, Trump appointees. So there's also a huge political uh, push that needs to be done simultaneously. Um, and in past years, like toward the end of the last Bush administration, uh, which guess what? Who was working for them? Bernhardt, who's now Secretary of Interior. He was Assistant Secretary of Interior uh, under the last Bush administration. He put out many of these same policies at that time um, and he's come back. But what happened there was once Obama came in, we were able to go to Congress and get Congress to actually pass a special law giving Obama the authority to rescind these regulations. Um, so we need to push that angle as well. It's one that's been very effective uh, for endangered species protection, uh, but it takes a lot of work uh, to get congressmen and women to pay attention and to understand and be lined up to do that. You can, as you can imagine, once Trump is uh, out of office, there's going to be a thousand different uh, agendas to undo what he's done. Uh, the Indian Species Act will just be one of those. So we need to get it at the top of the list. So with that, I'll turn it back to Quentin. And actually, I'm going to turn that and pass that to Valerie. All right. All right. 
Um, thank you so much, Kiran, for giving us the rundown of why this is so dire, what's at stake. Um, so it's clear that in this moment, Trump's war on wildlife is reaching new extremes. And because of that, we really need every single person to step out of their comfort zone, to take action, and even to step into leadership. Um, even those of us who don't identify readily as leaders, that is what the moment is calling for. So that's why we're building a movement to mobilize for the wild. And we've developed resources to teach you the skills necessary to become leaders at the forefront of this, this effort to really save life on earth. Um, and Mobilize for the Wild leaders work to, will first and foremost be working to fight off this attack to save the Endangered Species Act. But really we're all about working for all threatened species. And that includes wolves, jaguars, wolverines, monarchs. It all comes back to saving this fabric of life that we're a part of um, and that we depend on. So as I said, this is our next big campaign, fighting back this attack to save the Endangered Species Act. But we know that to win the big changes that the Earth so badly needs, we need to do more than one-time actions we actually need to build community and build leadership. So how do we do this? I want to share with you a leadership path and kind of a framework for how we build this movement. All right. So this is our leadership path to build our movement for the wild. The first step is showing up. Yay. And you've done that. Congratulations. You're showing up right now. So thank you so much. Um, the next step is to mobilize and educate others because we need more people to show up just like you are right now. Um, and that's where you come in. We're going to ask you to help engage your community to help us build the movement for the wild. The next step is going to be to lead actions. So this is actually to organize others to take coordinated action and demonstrate our power directly to decision makers. Um, so this could be meetups, letter writing parties, protests, lobby visits, petition deliveries. We'll come back to that. Um, and then after that, to mentor and train others. And some of you have already done this as part of our WOLF campaign. Um, and because once you gain these skills and confidence, then you become equipped to mentor and share it with others. And many of those people started out with no experience at all, and soon quickly discovered that they actually have the capacity to learn these skills and to train others. So um, when you choose to take action with us, it's not just a, a one-time thing, or we hope it isn't. You actually become part of this community of like-minded people um, who love this planet and love all the wondrous creatures that call it home. And at the same time, you gain access to uh, our tools, training, personal support to learn these skills and information and connect with others to fight for the wild. So thank you again for being on and taking this first step. Um, and I'm gonna now pass it over to Quinton to delve into how you can take deeper action on this campaign to fight to save the Endangered Species Act. Great. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, I see the very active chat questions about all sorts of ideas about what are we going to do? What is the plan? What's going to happen? Um, so let's get everybody to work and let's give you an idea of what we're planning. Um, our plan to save the ESA and to stand up for endangered species has three initial phases over the next six weeks. And when I say that, I mean that you know, the campaign will not be over within six weeks, but as Karan has pointed out, um, we have an illegal approach that's going to, you know, obviously multiple lawsuits uh, from the center. Uh, and we're here to handle who can we hold publicly accountable for the decisions that are being made. Karan had pointed out the regulations are being done in private uh, within the, the department. So we're here to make sure that every member of Congress understands how important the ESA is to wildlife and species across the country. So the first step is starting tonight and or tomorrow through September 9th, we are gonna ask 
that each of you call your representatives, both House members and senators. Um, Congress is on recess until September 9th. And what we want to do is make sure that when they come back, their voicemails are full of messages talking about the value of the ESA and the need for them to step up. The second part, starting September 9th, when Congress is back in uh, session through October 7th, we are asking uh, each of you tonight to collect 50 signatures within your district. Uh, and we will share with you uh, the petition that we have ready uh, demanding that the ESA be protected. And that will lead into once you collect those signatures. Now, don't take 50 as a ceiling. You can look at 50 as a floor if you want to be more active and engage your community there. Um, and this leads into our, our day of action for the ESA, which is going to be October 10th. Uh, and we are going to take uh, the petitions that you have uh, gathered, the signatures, uh, and we are going to do uh, deliveries and photo ops outside congressional offices to make sure they understand the grassroots wants the ESA. That's the message that we want to stand with every member of Congress to make sure no matter what party they're with, that they understand the importance of this. In addition to those uh, in-person signatures, we are also making a national push to get uh, signatures across the country. So we are going to make sure they get a delivery of how many thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, really support the ESA. So next week, we will be emailing you and texting you around calling your rep. Uh, not only we're asking that you do it, but to Valerie's point, this is a really important chance for you to share with your friends, family, coworkers, colleagues, and really make that same ask of them to do the same action. Uh, we really want to spread the word and expand our capacity to reach people. Uh, in addition, we will be asking you to sign up to collect petition signatures. Uh, we're going to launch a poll right now. Uh, you're going to see a screen pop up um, in front of you. It says, will you collect signatures to protect the Endangered Species Act? Uh, please take a moment and log your vote. That information is going to help us uh, know who we should follow up with uh, with regards to the petition uh, and further information about how to do that. So take a couple seconds and answer that poll. And I have to say, I'm watching it tick up. We are at, yep, we just crossed 200 people who said that they will collect signatures. So this is an incredible response. Thank you so much. Awesome. That's why we're here tonight is getting everybody activated. So this is a, a fantastic response. Um, you're going to see in a second after that poll is completed, um, we're going to launch a second poll and that will be talking about uh, our petition delivery day on October 10th. It's just six weeks away. So we're actually trying to get a head start with everybody, give you as plenty of notice as possible. Um, if you haven't done it before, I promise you, there are a few things as fun, as creative, as holding members of Congress personally accountable in their offices. And for those of you who have done it before, uh, it's a fun way to make sure they understand that people are watching and to really deliver that message uh, in person. So right now, if you have not uh, seen that yet, there should be a poll popping up. Please answer yes or no. If you can help us on October 10th. You're also welcome to bring friends with you, family members. Uh, the more the merrier on October 10th uh, to make sure that Congress people and their staff members understand that within their district and within their state, this is an important issue. Valerie, how are our numbers looking for our October 10th? Over 100, just hit 100. Yes, this is amazing. Great. Uh, I really, you guys are, this is what really generates a lot of uh, excitement for uh, all of us here at the center and the organizing department is really helping people take action to save the things that we love. So this is um, pretty awesome. I really appreciate everybody signing up. Uh, and if you're not sure yet, we're gonna come back around and ask you again uh, by email and text. So don't worry. Um, and if you haven't done it before, 
We're going to set you up with people and make sure you have plenty of support to do it. So thank you so much. That is our initial six-week plan. I also want to make sure for everybody on tonight's call, just to remind you all, uh, we will be sending out a transcript of the call, anything that you've missed, uh, and we will be following up with uh, the same asks by email, text, and otherwise. So you'll have a chance if you're not sure about your schedule. Uh, so it'll be your opportunity to do that. And with that, I will turn it back to my colleague, Valerie, and we'll do a little Q&A and answer some of the questions. I know some of you have quite a few questions about a variety of things, and we're here to answer them. Thanks. All right. A um, lot of questions here, so we'll do our best to sift through and get to as many as we can. Um, let's start with some clarifying questions about the action itself. So the petition delivery at local congressional offices, or DC, um, it will be at your local in-district offices. So you don't have to fly to DC, <laughs> you can do it from anywhere you are all across the country um, and invite neighbors and folks in your district to join you. Um, and then can the petition be shared electronically for signatures like emailing friends instead of in person? Yes, so both options will be available. We'll have an online link that you can spread that way um, and then also have the physical petition which we think is awesome, we value, because face-to-face -face conversations are the most influential in changing people's minds and activating folks. But at the same time, you know, like, you can hit a mass number of people with an email, so do both, and we'll make both available. Um, okay. Let me go back to some of the questions that are about the um, ESA, the, excuse me, never supposed to say that, the endangered species. <laughs> um, new regulations, an attack on, on the, the Endangered Species Act. So one question is, um, will the lawsuits that are being filed actually prevent this administration from moving forward, or can they do these horrid things as the lawsuit is or are waiting in court? Kieran? Uh, well, this is why we've been moving so fast. So uh, the regulations are out, they're in place, uh, they're being used at this very moment. And so one of the things that we'll be doing uh, is moving forward, seeking injunctions from the court uh, in which uh, we'll be saying to the court, please, put implementation of these on hold unless and until the court case uh, is completed because uh, these uh, multiple court cases it's gonna take to stop these. Uh, they could easily play out uh, over a year. If we win, the uh, administration's certainly gonna appeal up to the federal court of appeals. It could end up in the Supreme Court. So you could be looking there at uh, two or three years, potentially, of litigation over this. And so that's a whole lot of damage that can be done if implemented in that time. So we will be uh, seeking injunctions uh, to stop them. And the first uh, suite of maybe just two, perhaps three suits, they're going to be about the regulations in and of themselves. But then, as we see them start to get implemented, uh, so for example, if they strike down uh, the prohibition on killing wolves, or if they reduce the size of critical habitat for the polar bear, or they refuse to list uh, the monarch butterfly, if we see them implementing those, then we'll file a separate, different kind of lawsuit uh, that applies specifically to that action, to the polar bears or the wolves or the monarchs, and we'll be seeking injunctions there. So even if you don't get a broad injunction, say, uh, against the critical habitat regulations in themselves, you can get a specific injunction, hopefully, uh, where it's being used to kill polar bears or wolves or, or, or monarch butterflies. Um, so that's going to mean uh, bringing a whole series of as applied species specific cases over, over the next year. And um, 
as the person who asked uh, was right on, uh, our key is going to be to get an injunction in place while the litigation happens. Okay, great. Um, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, another question along these lines. So just which of the new regulatory changes does the center believe is most damaging for species protection? Well, you know, they, they're they all incredibly uh, damaging. Um, it's hard to um, pick some above others. You know, for example, the ones that undermine the Endangered Species Act listing process, well, if they succeed in keeping species from ever getting on to the endangered species list at all, then none of the protections of the act apply, uh, even, even the greatly weakened act. So that's uh, incredibly important. Uh, but on the other hand, the value of getting on to the endangered species list is that you have the habitat protection and now they're destroying that. You have uh, the legal prohibition on killing and uh, they're gonna greatly limit that. So uh, we're, we're approaching this as kind of a full court press, all hands on deck, um, and we're going after every single bit of the regulations, uh, which means more work, more attorneys, more organizing help uh, is needed, but that's how we have to uh, fight this thing. It's not, it's not the kind of situation where we can let something go by deciding it's not a high enough priority. These are all really high priorities, and now is the time for a full court press legally, a full court press politically, a full court press in the media. Um, this is what we're here for, and, and hopefully that's what you're here for to help get this work done. Nice. Okay, moving into action or why we're taking action, how we're taking action. Uh, so since this was an executive action by the Trump administration, um, what can my representatives do? Why are we targeting Congress? Ron? They can, yeah, they can do a lot. So, um, it is an administrative action, um, and you've got to fight the administration directly, doing that with the aviation and so forth. But uh, elected officials uh, in Congress can do a lot. So, for example, um, we're going to want to get congressional hearings put on about the regulations in order to put pressure on the administration and bring out. Uh, uh, how much damage has, is being done. And so we'll need Congress people to come in, support holding hearings. You know, the, our hearing space, hearing time is a very limited resource in DC. Everyone wants a hearing. So to get one, you've really got to elevate an issue to a high level. Now, luckily, um, uh, Raul Grijalva, Congressman Grijalva, is in, uh, head of the Natural Resource Committee um, in the House. Uh, he's very supportive, uh, so we've got a leg up there, but he's going to need a lot of help to make this happen. So that's one area they can do. Secondly, uh, Congress people can request uh, investigations by the Inspector General, by the Congressional Research Service by the Government Accountability Office, and they can set those in motion. They're the only people that can request that. Uh, environmentalists can't, the public can't, the administration can't, Congress can do that. Um, they can um, develop bills to legislate away some of these bad regulations. Uh, and just to jump in, sorry to interrupt, but that yeah. um, that is going to be our the core of our ask. We want all of these things to happen, but the thrust of our pressure on Congress for these calls, the petition, and for a day of action is actually to pass legislation to uh, undo some. Of yeah, and they and you can do that by directly striking them down, or as we saw at the beginning of the Obama administration, passing a law giving the next president the ability 
to do that, which is a little bit less of an ask, but can be uh, equally effective if you've got a good president. Uh, they can be spokespeople. They can mention this when they're talking to the media and make it a, a highlight, which again builds the sense that this is politically untenable. Uh, we've already saw two of the Democratic uh, presidential candidates come out on this exact issue and make it already a, a presidential candidacy issue. I want to see all of them do that. And they'll do that when they see the other Congress people taking it on, speaking about it, and essentially making it clear this is socially unacceptable. So uh, there's a lot of work that can be done. Also, uh, you know, Congress people can just simply demand information from the administration in a way that we are not able to do, and that puts tremendous pressure on them. So, so a lot to be done here by Congress. Um, and, and finally, even if we uh, succeed early on in, in striking down uh, all or most of the regulations, Congress can come in behind that and prevent this kind of thing from ever happening again. We can actually uh, say, no, no administration should be allowed to do this in, in the future. So uh, a lot of good work here to, to uh, partner with Congress. And there's a lot of good Congress people who vote the right way. We can count on them when a vote comes. But what we really need is for them to step up and be a leader. And that won't happen unless they hear from their constituents that this is a high priority and we're demanding more of them and simply voting the right way. Well, here's a good segue for that. So someone says, I'm in New Jersey. My Congress people are very environmentally minded based on their feedback I've gotten previously. So I'm not concerned about their response. But And their question is, how can I affect change outside of my state? But I would actually kind of pivot that back to how do we, if you have a supportive um, representative, what is your strategy or why do we need them to take the next step, become spokespeople, become champions? What can those folks do that are already on our side? Yeah, I mean, this is a really good um, uh, opportunity for them to step up uh, and, and be a leader. So, so I'll give you a good example. Cory Booker is running for president. He's already come out on this issue and said as president he'll overturn it. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has not said that yet. Uh, there's no reason uh, she shouldn't. It just hasn't made it on to her agenda yet. You can imagine she's a very busy person, uh, but she's very supportive. It's not yet at the top of her agenda. It needs to be so, and we can make it so. Um, and all the Congress people like in New Jersey, which is a, a really strong state for environmental issues, um, those Congress people are getting pulled in a million different directions. Right? I mean, uh, Trump has declared war on essentially everybody and everything. He's not a wealthy white corporate leader. So they're getting pulled in a lot of directions. They've got to make choices about where they're going to just vote and where they're going to invest their campaigning, energy, political capital. We need to get this on their list of where, the, where to expend that capital. Um, here's a question. So are you thinking about nonviolent direct action? I don't know, who wants to answer? Well, I, I certainly am. I do what Quentin <laughs> and Valerie have to say. I mean, <clears throat> you know, if the times call for it, and I think the times do call for it, depending upon we follow all the, uh, what I guess we would call the polite traditional uh, avenues of affecting change, uh, and given what the stakes are uh, for the planet, uh, I think that, you know, I don't want to speak since, you know, my boss is on the line, but I want to say <laughs> you know, that the center has a pretty decent history of, of escalating things to where they need to get to to make sure the appropriate level of change happens. So, so that's a yes. If, if we need it, <laughs> and it's going to be effective, yeah. And it's not for everybody, uh, but for those who want to do it and want to do it effectively, uh, yeah, absolutely. 
All right. Um, this is a very good question. So what is your strategy for passing legislation when the Senate is in Republican hands? Um, so here's the thing about passing your legislation though. Um, Congress overall passes very few laws each year. Um, and so the likelihood of a standalone bill passing, even if the Democrats had both houses is, is not high. There are just not many standalone bills that go through. So what happens though is bills are created and inter formally introduced to clarify what is needed. Hearings are held so that the public, the media, but other Congress people understand what is in these bills and then can take a stand uh, in favor of them. But what will finally happen at the end of the day um, is probably not that the bill itself passes, but the bill or parts of the bill get attached to the Department of Interior funding bill or the Department of Commerce funding bill. Or um, it's every few years, there's usually a big land protection bill passed that has a whole bunch of different things on it, clean air, clean water, land purchase, that kind of thing. Um, and this can then get put into one of these big land bills and pass in that direction. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, avenues for um, getting these measures passed without having to have the Senate specifically vote on this measure. And the other thing that happens is if you've got a bill out there that really systematically goes through and shows how to fix all these things, that becomes a really important uh, um, sort of litmus test for liberal position, democratic position. So then when the next president comes in, uh, says so a Democrat, they can look over and go, oh, I see what needs to be done. It's been specified in this bill. I'm now going to implement this as best I can through um, uh, administrative action. Uh, that happens a fair amount too. For example, um, Congressman Grijalva uh, introduced a bill, held hearings on it and so forth, uh, which would um, have banned uranium mining around the Grand Canyon on 2 million acres for a period of 20 years. He never actually passed the bill because what happened was the Secretary of Interior came in, Ken Salazar, and said, oh, I'm gonna take this language, I'm gonna translate it into a secretarial order, and I'm gonna make it happen at an administrative level. So, uh, so there's a lot of creative and important ways that these bills get uh, used, um, that it's, it's much more complicated than the conjunction junction uh, uh, Saturday cartoon we used to watch growing up on how legislation passes and influences things. <laughs> it is complicated, but it is a, a viable path for change, as Kieran laid out. Is one we actually get something passed or attached to something larger um, in this before the next administration, and the second reason to do it that Kieran laid out is because it actually sets the priorities for whatever administration is coming in next. So those are all good reasons to pressure Congress um, to raise, raise hell and get them to take action and get them to take sides. Um, so we have about five minutes left. I know there are a lot of unanswered questions. I apologize we didn't get to everything, um, but that's why we're here. So you can reach out to us afterward. We'll be following up. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Quinton to start wrapping it up. Great. Uh, first and foremost, to everybody who joined tonight's call, thank you. You are what make uh, our jobs possible, and you are the fuel that really does uh, push this movement forward. So I want to thank all of you. We had, uh, I think, at our peak, over 450 people on tonight's call, which is amazing. That's a wonderful turnout. 
Thank you so much to everybody that signed up to either collect petitions or to attend on the 10th. Um, just so everyone is, uh, understands the process from here, as Valerie pointed out, we are gonna be here all the time to answer any questions you might have and you will be getting an email tomorrow with all of the information that you need to get started. So please check your inbox tomorrow. Uh, and specifically for those of you who signed up tonight to take action, uh, Harrison and Diane or one of our other organizers on our team will be in touch by phone or text in the next few days with your specific next steps. Uh, in addition, uh, for those of you who would like to engage and feel a little bit more connected with us in a, in a different way, we're also going to offer you the chance to join us on Slack. Slack is an online community where it really facilitates real-time conversations, Q&As, uh, and sharing of information uh, in a very easy format. And we are sharing the link right now in uh, the chat. And that will give you an opportunity to uh, sign up for Slack and engage us in a much different sort of format than email. And it's a little bit quicker for us to respond to. So we'll share that out and feel free to sign up to join us on Slack. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we ended up with uh, over 450 people on this call. The, the message I hope everyone takes away uh, from tonight's conversation, from listening to Karan give us the, the lowdown on the Endangered Species Act, is when we fight, we win. We can win this battle. You, together with us, are part of a national and international movement to save life on Earth. This is exactly the fight that we need you to be a part of. Thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over to Karan for some final words before we head off. All right, well, um, I don't have much more to say here. Quentin really summed it up well. It's super exciting to see this many people on this call you know, willing to stand up for polar bears and butterflies and wolves and kit foxes uh, and, and just keeping life uh, alive at this moment in history when we're dealing with a global extinction crisis and also knowing that for everybody on this call there's there's probably uh four or five more of our supporters who will eventually join in and it's only through having that kind of leadership and mass force and organizing capacity that we can really turn this thing around. And we've seen that over and over again. Quentin said, when we fight, we win. That's, that's absolutely right. And, and the more we fight, and the more powerfully we fight, and the more people we fight with on our side as allies, the more likely we are to win uh, and to have bigger, longer lasting wins. So thank you for coming on. I look forward to fighting with you and, and winning with you. Uh, and saving life on earth.